Where is God in the midst of widespread suffering, persecution, and death? The story of Timothy Chung, who survived the horrors of communist leader Mao Zedong and his Marxist policies, which killed more people than any other ruler in history, is one answer to this question. The communist revolutionary Mao Zedong famously took control of China just four years after the end of World War II in 1949. He was determined to outdo the success of the British Industrial Revolution and to outshine Russian communism. To achieve this success, he implemented a program called the Great Leap Forward in 1958. This plan called for the collectivization of farms, the elimination of private property, the creation of worker communes, and the persecution of counter-revolutionaries who were to be fired, labeled as rightists, and banished to war camps. This disastrous policy led to widespread famine, killing between 30 and 45 million Chinese, and forcing the survivors to subsist on grass, bark, and dirt, and in extreme instances, cannibalism. This great starving time finally came to an end in 1962. In 1966, believing the communist movement was backsliding, Mao enacted another program called the Cultural Revolution to purify the nation and make it more truly communist. Rallying high school and college-age students to his cause, he transformed them into a paramilitary force known as the Red Guard. The Guard persecuted, humiliated, and killed intellectuals and those deemed not sufficiently communist. They destroyed religious relics and banned all impure capitalistic music, literature, film, and theater. Thousands were re-educated using the Red Book or the sayings of Mao. This bloody and chaotic period ended in 1976 with Mao's death. When it was over, another 10 million Chinese had lost their lives and millions more had been banished to work camps. A Chinese citizen by the name of Timothy Chung will experience all of these events and more. He is the son of a Chinese Christian doctor and is led to Christ by a missionary organization in the early 1900s in Tianjin, China. Timothy's subsequent decision to follow Christ, like his father, profoundly shapes the rest of his life, leading to a lifetime of persecution at the hands of the communists. Although an enthusiastic convert to Christianity at the age of 11, by middle school, Timothy's faith is waning, and he drifts from Christ, content to make money, smoke, and gamble like many of his peers. Then, in 1949, the communist takeover of China begins to change the trajectory of his life. He quickly loses his job at Texas Oil as American companies are driven from China. Shortly afterward, he becomes an accounting clerk at the Gospel Hospital. But within a year, the communists take control of his workplace. During this period, a motorcycle accident causes Timothy to re-embrace the faith of his youth, which proves to be a dangerous choice given the harsh, anti-Christian worldview of communism. Just how dangerous becomes evident in 1958, the year Mao's Great Leap Forward begins. Timothy, still employed at the hospital, is arrested as a counter-revolutionary and sentenced to three and a half years in a re-education camp or labor camp, a time span that eventually turns into 21 years of captivity. Kissing his wife Jane and their four children goodbye, Timothy enters Anway labor camp. Before his internment by the communists is over, he toils at a cooking plant, a supply center, a brick kiln factory, a rock quarry, and a farm. Shortly after arriving at his first camp, Timothy realizes just how radically his life has changed. He is assigned to quarters in which he shares one bed with 50 other prisoners. The bed he shares is made of bricks, is 100 feet wide, and is covered in flea and bug infested straw. Timothy's life is about to get much worse. The great leap forward, Mao's attempt to create a utopian communist society is failing, and starvation begins to hound all parts of Chinese society, including the work camp where Timothy is located. In response to the growing famine, the Chinese government rations rice, of which Timothy and his fellow prisoners receive very little. Soon, good news arrives. Jane, Timothy's wife, writes to him that she is saving some of the family's rice rations for him and is traveling 1,200 miles by train to deliver the rice in person. Timothy is overjoyed. When Jane arrives, it is a joyous occasion, as Jane and Timothy have much to catch up on. But the gnawing hunger in Timothy's stomach finally causes him to interrupt their conversation and blurt out, where's the rice? 
With tears in her eyes, Jane confesses that the rice spoiled on the long trip and she had to throw it away. Timothy is devastated. As the months and years pass, the famine grows worse. By year three, Timothy and his fellow prisoners are reduced to eating wheat husk, grass roots, and bean cakes, a food typically reserved to feed pigs. The lack of food leads to edema, or dropsy, among the prisoners, which is a swelling of the limbs, resulting in congestive heart failure, kidney disease, and even liver problems. Timothy becomes so debilitated, his communist captors move him from the rock quarry to a supply center and reduce his responsibilities to cleaning the offices of communist bureaucrats and an adjoining storage room. Ironically, his new assignment proves more challenging in some ways than working in the rock quarry. For as he is cleaning the storage room one day, he happens upon containers of candy. Hungrily, he eyes the chocolate and other delicacies. But Timothy knows that if he steals the sweets, his testimony will be compromised, and the communists will have grounds to ridicule his faith. So although starving, he resists. Then, when Timothy thinks he can endure no more, God intervenes. A sister, who has not communicated with him in over 20 years, mails powdered milk, lard, and other essentials to him and his family. This miraculous intervention saves him from starvation. Timothy celebrates this moment by reciting Lamentations 3.22. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. As Timothy regains his strength, he is sent into the cotton fields to work. Here, hidden among the cotton, he reads his Bible for brief moments, working even harder the rest of the day to make sure he always meets his quota. Timothy is further refreshed when he befriends a fellow prisoner, Brother Lee, a Christian evangelist. In the days ahead, Timothy will need his friend's encouragement and prayers. One afternoon, as Timothy is praying out loud over his meal, a camp officer hears him and becomes angered by Timothy's public display of faith. The officer decides to make a public example of Timothy by calling for a struggle session. These sessions are used to mock, heckle, hit, kick, shove, and sometimes for greater intimidation, even hang the accused from a tree or a beam. In preparation, Timothy meets with Brother Lee to pray, knowing these sessions could turn violent quickly. That night, the officer brings Timothy to trial. He summons many frightened people to testify against Timothy. Some are even fellow Christians. Their attacks are vicious, but to Timothy's relief, no violence is used. Timothy is even given the chance to speak. He proclaims for all to hear that he is indeed a Christian and that the Chinese constitution gives him the right to practice his faith in Christ. The officer who instigates the struggle session is furious and he announces he will hold a second session tomorrow to deal with Timothy's impertinence. The next night, even as Timothy braces himself for what he imagines will be a night of violence at his expense, the miraculous happens. The meeting is inexplicably canceled. With gratitude, Timothy returns to his barracks, where he rejoices, quoting Matthew 21, 42. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. However, Timothy's trials are not over. The following summer, in 1965, a communist officer comes to visit Timothy in his barracks and offers him his release, if only he will recant his faith. Amid the jeering of his bunkmates, Timothy refuses to deny Christ. One officer even tells him that if he will but renounce Christ, he can resume his faith when he returns home. Timothy again says no. A few days later, several of Timothy's fellow inmates are released and return to their homes in Shanghai. They go back just as the Cultural Revolution begins. Tragically, each of the returning prisoners become victims of the Red Guard. Young communist zealots who severely beat the young men and publicly humiliate them before large crowds of people. Timothy recognizes that had he renounced Christ and had been sent home, he too would be facing beatings and public humiliation and possibly even death. The long work days and the scarcity of food found in the work camp proved to be much better than the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. God protects Timothy once more. Year after year, Timothy is asked to renounce his faith, and he says no, and so is forced to remain in camp, separated from his wife and his children. Then, his sister Beatrice, who has immigrated to America, asks a church located in Texas to pray for her brother's release. 
After 21 days of fasting and praying in the year 1979, and at the age of 57, Timothy Chung is finally allowed to go home. Prayer in the midst of history matters. However, as a counter-revolutionary, Timothy is not allowed to get a job, and the Chinese communists continue to ridicule and mock him as an enemy of the state. But Timothy is not done practicing his faith. Seeing a great need by the Chinese people for the Word of God, he becomes a conduit for smuggled Bibles into China. In 1981, the Chinese government learns of Timothy's Bible distribution, and they arrest him. Timothy is terrified. He imagines at this point in his life, he would fear no man. But the truth is, he feels physically ill as he thinks about facing interrogation by the police. He cries out to God. Fellow believers hearing his plight also pray for him to have courage. Each interrogation lasts about eight hours and goes on for ten mind-numbing days. And the police hope to use Timothy as an informant to infiltrate the organization distributing Bibles. Timothy resists their harangues and intimidation, refusing to become a mole for them. He tells them to punish him as they see fit. In a rage, the chief interrogator beats the table declaring, every Chinese citizen has the obligation to serve his government. Miraculously, Timothy is released. However, he is blacklisted from traveling in China, placed under surveillance, and told he will never be allowed a passport to leave China. Nevertheless, during the next four years, Timothy applies and prays repeatedly for a passport to leave China, but the door is always closed. Once more, his sister in America asks the church to pray for her brother. This time, the church prays that God will grant Timothy a passport. In October 1984, the interrogator, who four years earlier told Timothy no one could deliver him, not even God, is now working at the passport office and is the very man who hands Timothy his passport. At the age of 63, Timothy leaves his homeland for America. A church in Kansas City gives him a job as a janitor. Miraculously, a few months later, his wife Jane is allowed to join him in America. Quoting Psalm 124:7, Timothy rejoices. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Timothy spends the next 30 years serving the church and proclaiming God's goodness and mercy. Where is God in history amid widespread suffering, persecution, and death? Timothy Chung's life is one answer. We hope you enjoyed this hidden tale of a history maker. If you did, please click here to subscribe, and you will probably enjoy our video about a tragic love story aboard the Lusitania in the midst of World War I.